Chapter 17, The Dagger-Toothed Cat Throughout his second night with Ceylon, Dar arose at regular intervals to fuel the night fire. Twice he saw the eyes of animals gleaming at him from beyond the cave entrance. When Dar awoke in the morning, Ceylon was seated in the sunlit mouth of the cave. He had thrown a leather hide over his lap and was working on a piece of ivory. Dar got up to join him. Thank you for keeping the night fire burning, Ceylon said to him. Without a fire, we might be sharing this cave with a hibernating bear or a wolf mother and her cubs. Dar thought of the gleaming eyes and had a new appreciation for his own clan's skin tents, which did not attract cave-dwelling animals. Dar squatted to watch his great uncle. Ceylon cut two deep circular grooves around the ivory piece, three fingers apart, with a flint chisel of a kind Dar had never seen before. Its beveled point dug deep into the ivory without shattering it. That's mammoth tusk, isn't it? Dar asked. What are you making? It's a small piece of a tusk that was once taller than you are, Ceylon answered. I'm making Mora a bracelet for you to take home to her. Dar sat down close to Ceylon. His great uncle picked up a mallet of antler and struck the ivory at the two places weakened by the grooves. The ivory broke cleanly, leaving a hollow circle in Ceylon's hands. Then he began to work on the circle, using the side edge of his chisel. Dar never took his eyes off Ceylon's hands. Great uncle, your old clan has been without you for many, many seasons. You and your carving skills would have added so much to our lives. Ceylon shook his head regretfully. My old clan didn't value my skills. My father told me carving was a waste of time. To hunt well was what a man was supposed to do. Nothing has changed, Dar said. I tried to teach myself to carve, but my uncle didn't understand my interest. In fact, it made him angry. He told me I had more important things to learn. Are you talking about Mora's son, Kenok? Ceylon asked. Dar nodded. He was a little boy when I left, Ceylon continued, and my sister was carrying her second child. That second child became my father, Dar said, then stopped speaking. Ceylon waited for him to continue, and his quiet interest again reminded Dar of his grandmother. My father's dead, he said. Ceylon put down his chisel. I'm sorry, Dar. He was killed by a strange animal just before I was born, Dar continued. Tell me what was strange about the animal, Ceylon said. I was told it was much like a lion, but with two huge teeth that hung down over its lower jaw, Dar said. No one had ever seen or heard of such an animal. Kenok was with my father when he was killed, and Uncle thinks it was a spirit creature sent to test him. That was no spirit creature, Ceylon said. I used to hear the old men of this clan talk about such an animal. They told me hunters used to kill one occasionally, and sometimes hunters were killed by them. It's called a dagger-toothed cat. They hold down their prey with their strong forelimbs, then rip it open with those dagger teeth. No one has seen one since I've been here, but people still tell stories about them, especially during our dances and ceremonies. Dar tried to picture the cat in his mind. Ceylon's voice became low and full of feeling. Kenok must have suffered, is probably still suffering. Dar thought of Kenok's quick anger. Why is he still suffering? Because he li lives thinking he failed the spirit test, Ceylon answered, and this failure led to the death of his brother. Dar had lived with his uncle's black moods as long as he could remember, and he often felt he was the cause of them. He had never considered there might be another reason for Kenok's temperament that had nothing to do with him. Ceylon picked up his chisel and the circle of ivory and held them up. Dar, this interests you. I know you thought you would stay here only for a night or two, but stay longer and I'll begin to teach you how to work on bone, antler, and ivory. They're better than wood or flint for making weapons. You need special flint chisels for the work, but I'll help you make these too. We'll spend the mornings together and you can practice with the spear thrower in the afternoons while I rest. Dar's face lit up, but he hesitated before answering. Ceylon smiled. It won't be all work, he said. 
Torek tells me that a small herd of musk oxen have been sighted moving down from their winter pasture to look for the new spring grasses. When they enter the far end of the valley, Torek and some others will hunt them. He wants you to go along. The invitation jolted Dar. This will be my first real hunt, and I'll be using the spear thrower. Dar's voice came out in a whisper. I'm afraid of failing in front of Torig and the other hunters. Would you rather take a chance of failing in front of Kenok at home? No, Dar burst out, and Ceylon laughed at the force of his answer. Dar tried to revive his sinking confidence. I'll be the only hunter in my clan to have a spear thrower. Dar, what do you think is going to happen when you get home and the men see your spear thrower and find out what it can do? Ceylon asked. The answer to Salon's question was obvious, and Dar's shoulders slumped. Why hadn't he thought of this before? Dar spoke in a subdued voice. They'll all want one. That's right, Salon said. Dar tried hard to recover from this blow. Well, I could be the person who makes spear throwers for the other hunters in my clan. Will you teach me how to make them with a carved animal on their handles? Spear throwers like yours aren't easy to make, Salon said. Remember what you learned yesterday. First, target the bush, not the tree. When you return to your clan, start making some spear throwers out of wood. When you get good at this, switch to antler. When you feel you're ready and you're, you really understand what you're doing, then start carving animals on them. I have a lot to learn from you, Antorig, Dar said. I will stay here a little while longer, great uncle.